Welcome to the conclusion of Cosy's Odyssey, where I'm running you through the massive Homeric epic that recounts Odysseus's journey home. Now his return begs the question, can you ever really come home? Now that we've finally arrived at the actual homecoming part of this Nostos journey, we're gonna change things up a bit. What we've covered previously, we've sort of been running between plot points and monsters just trying to keep up. But now that our protagonist has finally returned home, I think we can afford to take a load off. When Odysseus finally reaches the end of his decade-long journey home, Athena has actually disguised his beloved Ithaca, covering it in a sort of mist. I mean, she's rightly concerned about how rough his re-entry is going to be. He's super confused and has a bit of a meltdown until Athena comes to him disguised as a young nobleman to deliver the good news that he is, in fact, back on Ithaca. Rather than bursting into tears and yelling out, honey, I'm home, Odysseus replies rather sneakily, of course, saying, Ithaca, yes, I seem to have heard of Ithaca. He spins some sort of elaborate story about how he's just stumbled across Ithaca. Athena absolutely eats this up. Her little manipulative mortal is sort of a teacher's pet. And then she transforms into a more sort of goddessy version of herself to tell him that he is, in fact, back home and then he kisses the ground. After this suitably dramatic and heart-wrenching moment, Athena pops her teacher hat back on, telling Odysseus that he needs to seek out the loyal swineherd Eumaeus and pump him for information. Athena transforms Odysseus, turning him into an old decrepit beggar. And off he heads to the farm, where he's almost eaten by four guard dogs. Just because a cyclops isn't about to pop out doesn't mean this part's gonna be a walk in the park. Eumaeus is an absolute sweetheart, telling Odysseus, thank God my dogs didn't eat you because I've been through enough. My wonderful king has been away for an eternity, and here I am, fattening up my hogs for these god-awful suitors to feast on. But that's by the by. Come on in, random old man. Let's have some bread and wine and get to know each other. Here we have the lovely Eumaeus demonstrating something that was really important to the ancient Greeks, and something that we've actually seen at play a bunch of times throughout Homer's Odyssey. The importance of guest friendship, or xenia. The idea that beggars and strangers are sent from Zeus himself, or in this case, his daughter Athena. In a surprising twist, Telemachus, Odysseus's only son, has just returned from a little side quest. As soon as he gets back to Ithaca, he makes a beeline for the pig farmer. Now, their reunion is a very lovely and heartwarming scene, which we have to imagine was a real knife in the guts for Odysseus, who's forced to watch another man give his son a big cuddle. After this heart-rending hug, Telemachus sends the swineherd off to the palace to let his mum know that he's back. Eumaeus has to be a bit sly, as the suitors are quite taken with the idea of assassinating the young prince. The goddess reverses his transformation, and Telemachus has a complete meltdown, assuming that whoever or whatever is standing in front of him is some kind of god, so he panics and just starts sputtering about offerings. Odysseus assures him that he is his father, kissing his darling son and blubbering all over the place. Telemachus is finally convinced, and father and son sit there, weeping in each other's arms as years of pain and loss literally pour out of them. After an appropriate amount of cathartic blubbering, Odysseus gets back down to business, asking his son how many suitors are after his wife so he can figure out what to do next. Telemachus tells him that they are wildly outnumbered. Odysseus, with a staggering but not necessarily surprising amount of confidence, assures Telemachus that with the gods on their side, they've got this in the bag. Odysseus gets stuck into parenting immediately. The daddy of deceit tells his son how best to hide the suitor's weapons without making them suspicious. When Telemachus actually arrives home, the suitors are full of lovely, welcoming words, but they've got murder in their hearts. Odysseus, meanwhile, gets transformed back into his beggar getup, and he and Eumaeus shuffle off towards the palace. When they arrive, Odysseus is reunited with an all-time fan favorite, darling Argos, his long-enduring dog who he trained as a puppy and who is now somehow 20 years old. Just go with it. This sweet old dog has been horribly neglected, so he's just slumping around, covered in ticks, with his master nowhere to be found. I'm gonna paraphrase, but this is still gonna be pretty rough. Argos is just laying there, and as soon as he senses his master's presence, he thumps his tail but can't summon the strength to bring himself towards Odysseus. Odysseus hides a tear from the swineherd and Argos dies the very moment they are reunited after 20 years apart. So Odysseus's long lost pup just dies immediately as soon as he sees him. Probably not the welcome home our protagonist has been fantasizing about for 20 years. This moment, other than ruining me emotionally, speaks to something pretty important. 
Argos acts as a metaphor for home, in particular the maintenance of the home. Odysseus has been away for 20 years. The domestic side of things has completely fallen apart. He's neglected his son and a pack of suitors are circling his wife Penelope like vultures. Odysseus is just there weeping, knowing that he is at least in part responsible for the fate of his dog. The neglect of his kingdom, his home and his family is heartbreakingly captured in the sudden departure of Argos to the underworld. The stark, stark consequences of Odysseus's long absence are made painfully clear. Now we get to the bit where Odysseus actually arrives back to his own house, but he's still disguised as an old beggar. He potters around, sussing out each suitor, and things really kick off because Odysseus can't help but point out the irony of the situation when Antinous, one of the suitors, tells him off for begging for other people's food. The suitors have been feasting, gorging themselves on Odysseus's stores for years. Antinous throws a chair at him and Odysseus's mind churns with thoughts of bloody work. His famously loyal wife, Penelope, feels pretty bad about the whole chair-throwing situation, so she tells Odysseus's old nurse, Eurycleia, to wash his feet. But what Odysseus realizes about half a second too late is that his old nurse is about to blow his whole plan. He's got this super distinctive scar on his foot from back when he was a boy. So when Eurycleia starts washing his feet, she immediately recognizes him and has a complete meltdown. Luckily, Athena whisks away the tearful nurse, preventing her from squealing the news at the top of her lungs. It's quite a cool moment, really. We have these three female characters all operating around Odysseus, engaged in a sort of ballet of manipulation, subterfuge, and care, all centered around him. Speaking of cunning women, Penelope, Odysseus's wife, has actually come up with her own plan. The morning after this fateful foot bath, she drags out Odysseus's old bow, flings together a bunch of axes, and announces from underneath her glistening veil. Her veil is always glistening, it's a whole thing. That whoever, out of all of the suitors, can string this giant bow with the greatest ease, firing it through all 12 axes, that is the guy that she'll marry. After a bunch of faffing around and several failed attempts by the suitors, Odysseus sticks his hand up. The suitors kick off, Penelope defends her disguised husband, Telemachus sends his mum upstairs, and then what comes next is like something out of a Marvel movie. Odysseus is finally given the bow and he tests it, plucking the string in unison with a lightning strike sent by Zeus. Can you imagine that moment when the bow is finally back in your hands? It fits perfectly, realizations start spreading across the suitors' faces, and the king of the gods himself sends you a sign, essentially saying, mate, you've been through enough, welcome home. What follows is more Tarantino than Marvel. Robert Fagels, one of the more famous translators of the Odyssey, titled this chapter, Slaughter in the Hall. There's blood all over the floor. There's blood coming out of people's noses. Someone gets trussed up like a turkey and is hung from the rafters. Homer compares the piles of corpses to piles of fish heaped up in a fishing net. The old nurse waddles off to tell Penelope the good news, but even though she's been so hopeful for so long, Penelope assumes Eurycleia has lost the plot. The old nurse keeps trying to convince Penelope to no avail. Telemachus even accuses his mother of being cold-hearted. All of this sets us up for one of my all-time favorite moments in the Odyssey. For a lot of people, one of the most special parts of a relationship is that unique language you develop together. Countless inside jokes, obscure, absurd references that only make sense to the pair of you. After 20 years apart, Penelope and Odysseus still share this incredibly powerful, meaningful intimacy. Penelope oh so innocently says that she wants to welcome the stranger, telling Eurycleia to move the bed and fling some fleece on it. Odysseus bursts into a fit of rage at this, yelling at his darling wife, saying, woman, your words, they cut me to the core. How dare she suggest that the bed be moved? Doesn't she remember that he's the one that built that bed? Using a tree trunk for one of the bedposts. Of course she remembers. With that final tantrum, our exhausted, traumatized protagonist confirms his identity. Penelope goes literally weak at the knees and Odysseus wept as he held the wife he loved, the soul of loyalty, in his arms at last. Finally, we have our tearful reunion between Penelope and her long absent husband. After they get the steamy reunion out of the way, they stay up all night talking, confiding in each other, trading stories as they lie in each other's arms. And there you have it, 
the Odyssey in a day.